Hey everybody, it's Mr. Robbins back again to continue and complete our discussion of Unit 12. Uh, so in Unit 12, we've been talking about the Cold War. Uh, we've been talking about um, how this Cold War is developing on an international stage and how it's leading to American involvement in the politics in Europe and Asia, including uh, potential military involvement like in the Korean War. We talked about how this Cold War is influencing American society and kind of the creation of a second Red Scare and McCarthyism and fears of uh, the atomic bomb and how that's kind of provoking Americans to um, want safety and security. Um, things like the space race being seen as bigger competitions between our system and the Soviet system of communism. All of this together would give you an idea that America in the 1950s is just a time of complete anxiety and fear and everybody's hiding in a bunker underneath their house because they're scared to go out, right? What we find, though, is that the America of the 1950s is a lot more complicated than that. Yes, this Cold War is going on. Yes, it is a constant presence in the back of people's minds. People are afraid of nuclear war, but of course we know that doesn't actually come to pass. It doesn't happen in the 1950s or in the 60s or 70s or 80s or 90s or the 2000s, okay? We know that doesn't happen. Um, and instead, when many Americans look back at the 1950s, they see one of the last good eras of American history when, when America was united and, and all these things and the economy was great. Um, but even that is not really a totally true representation of the 1950s. Uh, we'll see that there are going to be some Americans who are not part of that wealth and that kind of good times of the 1950s, and they're going to start to publicly talk about that. Um, and so as we finish up this decade of the 1950s, we're really going to start to dig into what society in the 1950s looked like what might have been good, why it might be remembered well in many uh, the memories of many Americans still alive today, but then also why there were some problems in the 1950s that were emerging that are only going to become more important as we move forward into the final units of this course. So let's go ahead and begin. Um, now, we do need to take a step back and again look at the end of World War II. We talked about the end of World War II and kind of what that did with our foreign policy uh, as we were going into this Cold War. But as far as the American economy goes, it is a pretty positive story after World War II ends. Um, as we are leaving the World War II era, you have to realize that Americans across the board were, were in this, you know, period of World War II, a long period where, you know, consumption was, was limited because... We're using all our resources to help fight the war. But before that, of course, America was in the Great Depression, which had a similar situation where folks couldn't get, you know, whatever they wanted. Um, and the economy wasn't great. People didn't have jobs. Well, now at the end of World War II, the economy has been stipulated. The Great Depression is gone. And we have high wages for workers. Soldiers that fought in the war, they're coming back home with service pay for their service in the war, uh, Americans that bought war bonds, which was thousands and thousands, maybe millions of Americans bought war bonds, they're going to start to uh, get that money back in the 1950s, and so Americans have a lot of money to spend. It is a time of a great economic boom, which leads America and Americans to enjoy the highest standard of living in the world at the time. And with that, we see the reemergence of consumerism. Now, we talked about consumerism back in uh, Unit 9 when we talked about the roaring 20s and whatnot, uh, people going out and buying new uh, uh, appliances, new uh, inventions for the 20s. Well, that is a very similar theme that we see in the 1950s. Now, the goods, there are newer goods now that people are buying, most importantly television sets. Uh, Hi-fi record players, so these are not new per se. Record players have been around before the 50s, but these high-fidelity record players would play the music at an even better quality uh, for folks to listen to. Uh, we see that a lot of these new goods are going to be bought on credit. Uh, 
uh, just like we saw in the 1920s. However, the system of credit is becoming more like we would imagine it today, where most of the credit is going to come from a financial institution like a bank that's going to offer you that credit to purchase whatever you'd like at a store instead of the store offering you credit and doing it that way. Um, now, to this point, we see the first credit card, uh, which was made by the uh, predecessor of today's Bank of America, came out in the 1950s. It was a very, very primitive thing. It wasn't like plastic like ours are today. Uh, it was actually like on a cardboard piece of paper, and you'd have to write down the code uh, to charge the card and all that. But uh, that is kind of the beginning of what we would imagine to be credit cards today was in the 1950s and how many Americans access credit. We see advertisers are doing their thing to try and get consumers to buy their goods. They still use the older stuff, the radio, uh, newspaper, magazine advertisements, but also TV commercials, which are going to become really one of the main ways by the 1960s that advertisers reach their customers. And we also see the growing of franchises, uh, businesses, uh, with kind of independent units that are on under a larger business, right? So franchises today, most of us think about fast food franchises where, you know, there are McDonald's across the country. Not all of those are actually owned by the McDonald's Corporation. Many of them are owned by franchisees who are like individual owners of like one McDonald's. They're in the large McDonald's network uh, and they get all the same products but technically that store is owned by a franchisee that is operating it for McDonald's. And this is how we start to see chains of fast food restaurants, of, of stores going national, where that if you live in Georgia or you live in California and if you go to McDonald's, you get a Big Mac, they didn't have a Big Mac yet, but if you get a Big Mac, it's going to be the same thing, right? Even if you're buying it in two completely different areas of the United States that starts to provide some uniformity across the country for these products. Now, a lot of why this consumerism is happening is because this is the first time since the 1920s that Americans had access to cheap electrical appliances as factories go back to making consumer goods, cars as well, but then also um, the uh, uh, access to credit, right? Now, we see that part of it is that more families are making more and more money. Uh, you see throughout the 1950s, the median family income, so this is an average, but kind of the, the number in the middle of the data set, slowly increasing throughout the 1950s into the 1960s, but pretty, pretty consistent increase. And appliances, some of them have been around since the 20s, and they're just kind of getting more and more advanced, like refrigerators, okay? Uh, waffle irons to make some waffles. Those look delicious, okay? Television sets, though, these are new, right? Although uh, these are not the televisions you and I are used to today. 16-inch, um, 20-inch tube televisions, so they're square, they're big, they're heavy. Only, pr only in black and white at this point wouldn't really be until the 60s we start to get widespread color television, although that would come as well. Tupperware. Uh, for your leftovers, right? And then Coca-Cola, something that had been around for a long time, but focusing on these kind of 1950s advertisements. And this will be something we'll talk a little bit later. Uh, the woman here uh, with the vacuum cleaner next to her, uh, the pause that refreshes at home, okay? And then cars. Cars are going to become a huge, huge thing, which, again, cars had been around and more and more Americans have been able to access having a vehicle by the 1920s. But in the 50s, we're going to start to see the phenomenon where most American families have access to at least one car, but increasingly, American families are going to have access to two vehicles. So maybe dad could go to work, and then mom could also be able to have a car to drive around to do errands, which we'll get into that dichotomy later. Now, we do see credit use of credit increases throughout this period. Um, however, we don't necessarily see in the 1950s the same problems we saw during the 20s because as uh, folks get uh, spend more and more credit, they're also generally getting more and more in income. And so they're able to, to 
to pay down their debt, reasonably speaking, um, although this is going to be a problem for later generations. It's not a problem in the 50s because most of these people in the 50s, they remembered enough about what the 19, late 1920s and 30s looked like to not go overboard. Now we also see, uh, it starting really right after World War II, but accelerating throughout the 1950s, the so-called baby boom. Now, this would create, at that time, the largest generation in American history, right? Now, the children that come out of this are going to be called the baby boomers, or today we oftentimes call them boomers, okay? Uh, and this roughly, um, this, this translates to roughly to Americans born uh, from about 1945, late 1945 into 1946, until around 1964 or 65, so about 20, a little less than 20 years immediately following the end of World War II. Now, why is this happening now, okay? Well, there are a few reasons. One, as often during an economic depression or recession, uh, the birth rate in the United States during the 1930s actually went down, okay, as people had fewer children or no children at all. And then during the war itself in World War II, millions of American men are abroad fighting, uh, which means that, you know, some of them might have got married before they left, but many didn't. Um, and so when they come home, those that did make it through the war, they are going to be looking to get married and start a family. And this is happening all at once, right? And so we see marriages uh, rise a huge amount, and then also the birth rate rises a huge amount as we go through the end of the 40s into the 1950s. And what we see by the time of the late 50s is that this baby boom is causing demand for goods to increase, right? So demand for baby products, uh, things like diapers, furniture, cribs, um, toys, right? Um, but then also schools, as you need to build more schools for a growing population of students, and homes to ho house a growing family, okay? Now, this shows us the U.S. birth rate from 1940 to 1970. So you see that sometime in the 1950s, around 1957, it peaks, okay? Uh, but at its peak in 1957, you have a baby being born every seven seconds in the United States. So while it's not a perfect thing, it's not like the, the mamas timed it out with the doctors to be like, listen, you got to wait because your turn is seven seconds from now, right? That's not the way it works. But just imagine the rate here. So baby is born here. Baby. baby, baby, right, all year long for 1957. That leads to a huge population boom, okay, and with it, we see these goods, okay, the Gerber baby, uh, the Gerber baby now, uh, actually, she had just passed away, like, a uh, uh, couple years ago, right, but she was the, um, model for this baby that is still used on Gerber projects today. If you go to the grocery store, you'll see it on their products in the baby food aisle, okay? Uh, Dr. Spock's baby and child care. Now, to be clear, this is not Dr. Spock from uh, Star Trek. It's an actual person, a guy named Benjamin Spock, who wrote this book that was a huge bestseller, uh, bought by many parents of young children in the 1950s, had lots of pieces of evidence about how to raise a child, like have a positive relationship with your child, a caring, nurturing relationship. Things that like today you're like, wait, before the 1950s, people didn't care and nurture for their child. I mean, they did, but not really in the way we would do it today. Okay. Fisher Price toys. Okay. You start to see these pop up. Although I think this is from a little later because I, I definitely had some toys. I had this thing. Um, you put a car at the bottom, and it, you, it has a little wheel, and you wheel it up, and then it gets to the top, and then it comes out, and it goes down the ramp again. So, um, But Fisher-Price, you know, toys start to become common in the 1950s, okay? I'm not that old, all right? And then here's school enrollment, something near and dear to my heart, right? Now, you see it's not like an immediate thing, right? 
We really start to see school enrollment really take off in the 1960s and the 1970s uh, because it's slow, right? Like, you know, you don't go to school right after you're, you're born. There's a period five, six years before you go to school. So we start to see those numbers really increase in the 60s and the 70s. Now, to that point of homes, though, we see that this demand for homes and bigger homes is going to lead to a new phenomenon. Now, we had seen suburbs developing in the, in the United States as early as the 1920s, but the suburbs as you and I would imagine them today, given that we live in one, they really had their genesis in the 1950s, okay? So we see these suburbs, areas outside of cities, areas that a lot of times before any building occurred were more rural or country areas, are going to become this thing between the city and the country, right? Suburbs. So they're not really urban. They're not like a city. They're outside the city, uh, but they're also not the countryside either. Think Swanee in comparison to Atlanta, which is a big city, or Swanee in comparison to like North Georgia or South Georgia where it's like, you know, farms and stuff, okay? Now, why do we see all these new suburban developments? There are many different reasons. One is access. We see that um, soldiers especially coming back had access to a lot of benefits by virtue of being a soldier, most notably the GI Bill of Rights. Now, this GI Bill of Rights would do many, many things, but most importantly among them, provide very, very cheap loans to former soldiers to buy homes, right? And these, these loans would be at very attractive rates um, that would make it where, you know, you, you would have to pay money uh, to buy the home and, you know, you had to pay interest on your home loan, but it is one that's really, really affordable, right? And not just that, the GI Bill of Rights also paid for tuition, for soldiers to go to college, to get a better career, get better pay and better income, and so on, right? Now, at this point, much like today, most Americans worked in a big city, okay? But they didn't want to live in the big city anymore. We see that the cities uh, are becoming increasingly uh, uh, more, and more, uh, more and more crime popping up in big cities. We'll talk about why here in a little bit. Um, so a lot of people feel unsecure in the cities, but it's not just that. It's also that in the city to get a bigger home, it's going to cost more money than it would be to get a similar size home further out in the suburbs, okay, for a grown family. So these suburbs, they, they do provide that peace of mind. They do provide affordable homes and then new and good schools for your children to go to, right? Now, home ownership throughout the 1950s increases from uh, somewhere around 24 million homeowners to uh, about 33 million homeowners, so a con consistent increase throughout the 1960s. But the growth of these suburbs is happening so quickly, you do get scenes like this where it seems like thousands of people are becoming homeowners all on the same day, right? Now, this shows us growth rates, growth rates for urban areas and suburban areas, okay? Now, what this shows us, number one, is that in every single part of these decades, from 1920 to 1970, both cities and suburbs are growing, okay? So if this is a positive number, that means that there is a growth in the city, okay? But what we're looking here is uh, relatively where is the growth occurring, and you see by the 1950s and 60s and then the 60s to the 70s, most suburbs are growing at a rate in the 1950s around 50 percent growth rate okay year over year for population whereas the cities they only have about a 10 percent growth rate so far far smaller right now what do these homes these suburban homes look like well they're not necessarily as big as you and i would probably think as living in the suburbs today most of these suburbs are very very small single family homes this is an example of a uh a home built by home builder uh, Bill Levitt, uh, who will become a really, really important person in the development of these suburbs. Uh, these homes, so, so for example, you'd have two bedrooms, one master for the parents, and then one bedroom for the kids to share, uh, a, a, a living room, a kitchen, okay? Um, but usually that's it, one story, two bedrooms, uh, a uh, tile bathroom, a garage, small backyard, a front lawn, 
and then they would be smushed into these large, large suburban communities. Now, Bill Levitt, I brought up him specifically because he is going to be kind of a, a revolutionary guy in setting up these uh, sub suburbs, especially in the Northeast. So around cities like New York and Philadelphia, uh, you see the development of these Levitt towns where he will use mass-produced homes that he learned how to do mass production working for the Navy during World War II. So just like they mass produce ships during World War II, they're going to end up mass producing homes. They make as many of the pieces at home as they can, at, at, like in factories as they can. Then they assemble it on site, and this allows them to build dozens and dozens of homes a week, and then hundreds of homes in these large suburban areas outside of big cities like New York very, very quickly. There's an even bigger zoom out of one of these Levitt towns. And there are actually several Levitt towns. The most importantly was in Long Island, New York, but other cities had these Levitt towns too due to how quickly they spring up when Bill Levitt and his company came to town. Now, we talked about population growth, but this shows us distribution of the population in these different eras. Uh, in the 1940s, uh, most people still lived in, uh, in rural areas. Um, Whereas the cities are, are still, you know, a, a chunk, but really only a third of, of Americans live in the city. By 1950, we see that the cities are growing a little bit, but look at that growth in the suburbs. It's pretty huge, around 4% growth uh, in the rural areas, fewer and fewer people living in rural areas. And by 1960, then you see, again, cities didn't grow that much as part of population, but suburbs have by about 10% since uh, the 1940s, while less and less Americans are living in rural areas by the 1960s. Now, suburbs really will change American life forever, okay? Now, it's one of the things that, you know, is a, a chicken and an egg type situation, right? We talked about the development of the interstate highway system in the 1950s as a way to connect uh, uh, America together and to provide evacuation routes in case of atomic war. But we find that these highways also make the suburbs much more accessible where, you know, the family uh, worker, usually the dad, can get on an interstate, get to the big city fairly quickly from his suburb outside of the city center. And so do suburbs lead to more people wanting cars and the development of more highways? Yes, but it's also the other way around. As there are more highways and more cars available, the suburbs become an attractive option. So they kind of feed into each other, okay? As people move out to the suburbs, though, we also see institutions as well. So churches that have been in major cities, they start to make uh, parishes or move completely out into the suburbs. New schools are built out in the suburbs. Grocery stores and, and new shopping centers are going to be built out in the suburbs for folks to go to, okay? Um, but there is a dark side to all of this, right? That all this sounds good and great, like, hey, the suburbs are growing. It's cool. It's good. Yes, but the reality is, is that the suburbs were not for all Americans, okay? Now, for a variety of reasons, we see that the suburbs are mostly inhabited by white families, right? Increasingly, white families are leaving urban areas, okay, but the African Americans that live in those urban areas and other minorities are not able to take those advantages to move out to the suburbs. Why? One, uh, minority families, on average, don't have as much money to put down to buy a house, okay? Uh, but it's not just that, okay? We see things like the GI Bill of Rights, uh, would help white soldiers more than it helped black soldiers, as the law was written, okay? And then banks uh, would use kind of shady tactics like uh, redlining to basically make it where black folks especially could not buy a home in certain parts of a city or suburb, basically to keep those suburbs all white, okay? Now, sometimes... The banks did the opposite thing, and they did blockbusting, where they would actually make a fake, like a hired black family move into a neighborhood so that that would inevitably cause white folks in the neighborhood to want to leave, causing home prices in that area to drop, 
where then the bank could buy them up really quickly and redevelop those neighborhoods, which many banks did. Now, eventually, these processes are going to be found out. and They're going to be seen to be obviously discriminatory, and eventually laws are made to address them in the 1960s and 70s. But in the short term, what this means is that the phenomenon of suburbanization is one of white folks moving out to the suburbs, not black folks and other minorities. Now let's talk a little bit about cars, okay? Now cars, as I mentioned, are an important part of all of this, right? Now the suburbs not only um, make the uh, suburbs more attractive, or the cars not only make the suburbs more attractive, but suburbs make cars more attractive, right? So people want one, maybe two cars, okay? And when you add new advertisement, easy access to credit, and then cheap gasoline, we're talking about like 40 cent gasoline a gallon, right? A lot of us are like, whoa, what? That's pretty crazy. I want that. Um, yeah, we don't have that anymore, okay? Now, we mentioned it last time in the context of the Cold War, but the interstate highway system under the National Interstate Defense Highways Act was passed in 1956, leading to the development of 41,000 miles of interstates, highway, expressways, which, of course, are made for that defensive aspect to get us out of the city in case of atomic war, but really were used more for traveling in and out of the big cities to the suburbs or travel across the country. And now automobiles, of course, in this time period are very, very different, okay? They were big and flashy. You see kind of uh, these two-tone paint jobs, uh, white wall wheels, right? They're huge. They're mostly made of steel, so they're big and they're heavy and they have big engines in them. Uh, you have these uh, uh, things like the fish tails on the back, uh, uh, the convertible with the two-tone paint job, okay? Everybody's seen cars like this. This is very much a norm, Okay. And people are driving them on these new and improved interstates across the country that are going to be built throughout the 50s and moving into the 1960s. But, of course, they don't quite look like they do today. This is one of the interstate highways, which I'm trying to think of another one that would be like this uh, narrow with only four lanes. Uh, you have to go pretty far out of a big major city to see that today. Now, all of this meant that Americans are going to be a lot more mobile than they were before, okay? You could do things like taking long-distance vacations. Maybe you go to Disney World, okay, or Disneyland. Disneyland is in California. Disney World's in Florida, okay? So you're going on long vacations, road trips, right? Also living further from your jobs. We see that new businesses pop up around cars. So drive through restaurants and drive in restaurants and then drive in movies, are going to become a common activity of the 1950s to kind of realize that all these people have their cars and want to drive around, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about what the home life looked like for the average American in the 1950s. Now, based on what you're looking at in TV and movies and other advertising, you're going to see a very clear stereotype of what the average American home looks like in the 1950s. And it is one that kind of creates conformity. Like when Americans see this, if they don't really fit this mold, many Americans think, hey, this is what is expected of me, so I need to be like this, right? And so television shows and advertisings, they, they depict the ideal woman as a housewife and mother who, you know, cleans the house, makes dinner, makes the meals, take care of the, take care of the kids, stuff like that. Um, you know, here's some examples, Mary, no reason to neglect stockings. Okay. Like, Hey, even if you're not going out of the house, your husband doesn't want to see runs in your stockings. Okay. So harder the wife works, the cuter she looks and the husband comes home. Gosh, honey, you seem to thrive on cooking, cleaning, and dusting. And I'm all tuckered out by closing time. What's the answer? Vitamins, darling. I always get my vitamins. So she always has prep pep to, to, to do all the cleaning, right? This is kind of a joke one, uh, but don't worry, darling, you didn't burn the beer. Oh, okay, well, that's good. Now, the guy, as those imply, his role was the provider. He brought home the bacon. He was the boss of the house. He made, you know, he called all the shots and made all the decisions for the family, okay? And then 
between both men and women, there were behavioral rules, right, uh, in the 50s. You were supposed to obey authority. You were supposed to always control your emotions and never get too emotional in public. You were supposed to fit in with the crowd. Don't stick out like a sore thumb. And never, ever, ever, ever think about sex because that's not what we do, right? But in all of this, guys, hopefully you, you see that the way that we might perceive that people are in the 1950s doesn't actually line up in reality what actual experience was in the 1950s, okay? One, we'll talk about this uh, uh, sexual behavior, okay? One, um, we see that uh, due to studies by um, uh, scientists like Alfred Kinsey, we'll see that uh, despite what you would think from watching you know, these TV shows, one, premarital sex was quite common, people having sex before marriage, and extramarital affairs, uh, and of course, in this case, we're talking about the propensity for men to cheat on their wives was high, but the flip side was also true. Women uh, cheated on their husbands, too. It just was not something you talked about. You kept secret, but it was quite common and frequent in the 1950s and before, okay? And there were other folks in society that rejected these stereotypes and these norms, okay? Uh, we see one such group will be called, called the Beatniks, okay, or the Beat Movement. Uh, this would include artists and writers who refuse to conform to lives in the 50s. They uh, don't want to go live out in the suburbs. They want to live in the cities, even if they're dirty and crime-ridden. They don't care. They don't want to go buy out, con buy consumer goods and get the newest TV or radio. They don't care. They don't want to get a regular job in the 9 to 5 where you have to wear a suit and tie and go dress up and all these things. No. They want to have their own freedom. Now, one of the most notable of this uh, beat movement would be this guy, Jack Kerouac, who wrote a famous novel called On the Road, which uh, kind of documented some of his journeys across the country, living kind of this free lifestyle and you know, not having a regular job or anything like that. Now, the beats, though, are a small movement that are later going to be more popularized and some of their uh, non-conformist ideals more popularized by the better-known hippies of the 1960s, but we'll save those for another day, right? But also, when we start talking about social groups, we'll see that social groups perceive the 1950s very, very differently. And First, I want to talk about women, okay? Now, if you watch the media, if you watch the TV shows, if you watch movies, if you saw advertising, you would get the impression that all women, or most of the women in the 1950s, were mothers and homemakers. But that's not quite the case, right? In the 1950s, somewhere around 40% of all mothers had jobs, okay? Some of those are single mothers, right? And then some of those are married women who don't just stay at home and take care of the kids and clean the house. They have to have a job to make ends meet, okay? But even among some of those women who were the ideal housewife and cooked and cleaned and took care of the kids, there were at least 20% of those sur suburban women by survey who would say this was not what the kind of life they wanted. Maybe they went to college and now they just are a housewife, okay, and so they feel dissatisfied or they feel isolated and bored out in the middle of the suburbs with no one to interact with, right? Now, we do see and we do have to pump the brakes on like women outside the home the ones that are working are still working in mostly women-dominated industries like nursing, teaching, and clerical jobs. But again, it's not a little number of women working outside the home. A large number of American women are working outside the home. Okay, But that is just one piece of it. Because at the same time all of this stuff was going on and there was a desire to conform and this idea of America as this great society and folks moving out to the suburbs, at that same time, we are seeing the development of the civil rights movement. How do those coexist? Because if you look back at how black folks were treated in the beginning of the 40s and early 50s, they're probably going to think a lot differently about what the 1950s mean to them as opposed to uh, white Americans at the same time. Now, in the year 1950, the United States was still very much a segregated society, okay? In the South, you saw the development of Jim Crow laws that we talked about at the end of uh, Unit 6, and we talked about them again when we got to the Progressive Era uh, in Unit 9. Um, these 
uh, or Unit 8, sorry. Uh, these Jim Crow laws created by law a segregated society, okay? This is what we would call de jure segregation. De jure in Latin, all it means is by law, okay? So these are laws that make it where white and black folks cannot interact in the same schools or the same restaurants or the same hotels or movie theaters or what have you, okay? But we also have de facto segregation, which is happening in the South, but also throughout the United States, okay? Most notably that white flight that I talked about. As more and more white folks move out to the suburbs, right, African Americans are left in the inner cities, okay? And this is not a law, per se, that said, oh, the white folks get to move to the suburbs and the black folks get to stay in the cities. There weren't laws to this point, but it was a definitely a phenomenon that was occurring. So we call this kind of segregation de facto segregation. De facto means in Latin, in fact, okay? So it's segregation, it's not by law, but it exists, it just exists in fact, okay? But starting with World War II, we start to see the push for more civil rights for African Americans. Uh, we see that one of the first successes happened in 1948 when President Truman will uh, attack segregation by issuing an executive order to integrate the military. So for the first time in American history, white soldiers and black soldiers will fight alongside each other in the same units, okay? Now, this would make it where the first war uh, of... Uh, that period uh, with integrated troops would be Korea starting in 1950. Though the troops that go to fight, the units that go to fight in Korea will fight in, in desegregated units, integrated units. We also see that Truman will use his power as the ex uh, chief executive to outlaw discrimination in the hiring of government employees. But that is really all that Truman can do. He can only really change things in his direct purview he can't really change the larger laws about segregation without congressional action, okay? Now, on other fronts, we see that other parts of American society become uh, uh, integrated, like Major League Baseball. In 1947, Jackie Robinson would become the first black player to play in Major League Baseball when he is signed by the Brooklyn Dodgers. At that point, the Dodgers were in Brooklyn. Later, they would move to Los Angeles. Um, but he would be signed in 1945 and would debut in 1947 in, as a player for the Dodgers. And as a player for the Dodgers, he would become the Rookie of the Year for his uh, first season. And then uh, a couple years later, he would win the MVP for the National League uh, as he helped lead the Dodgers along to a pennant chase. Now, Jackie Robinson is a really, really interesting character, okay? Was he the best black baseball player at the time uh, in the uh, so-called Negro Leagues that came before this? Probably not. There were actually dozens and dozens of really, really talented black players in the Negro Leagues, many of which that could have ended up being the first player in MLB. But we also know about Jackie Robinson is that his personal disposition was also a reason why he was chosen. Uh, it was pretty well known and understood by Branch Rickey, the uh, owner of the Dodgers, that this was going to be tough for whomever was the first black player in Major League Baseball, and they were going to face some hate. And that's exactly what was, was Jackie Robinson's experience, that he would get yelled at uh, by fans all the time, shouting the N-word at him. But even that, sometimes like the other players and, and the managers, like when they would play the Phillies, um, they would get yelled at. And the, the, the managers would yell at, at Jackie Robinson, try to get a rise out of him, okay? Um, but Ricky and Robinson both knew, like, as soon as Jackie Robinson, like, stood up for himself, that would just destroy this whole experiment, right? That, oh, he can't control his emotions or he's, you know, too, too crazy or, you know, out of control or a loose cannon, so he had to take a lot of these insults ju and just deal with them and move on and put it as more and more uh, fuel to the fire to be a good baseball player, which did seem to work out for Jackie Robinson. Now, all that said, those are on the kind of outsides of the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. They're, they're important, but they're not really the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. What we see is the beginning is, happens in the year 1954. That's because in the year 1954, the Supreme Court will 
make a decision in the Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas case. Now, this case is very, very important, so I'm going to call it a few different things. Uh, Brown v. Board of Education, okay? Some folks will even shorten it to Brown v. Board, but this is an absolutely thing that you've got to, got to, got to, got to know uh, from this set of notes and for Unit 12, okay? Now, as some background, we talked about in the progressive era the development of the NAACP, okay? And ever since its founding during the progressive era, the Na uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, had been the leading force in civil rights. And they were leading the civil rights movement by lawsuits. And they were uh, focusing on, at this point, suing segregated schools, okay? Now, they started on the collegiate level, um, uh, suing uh, colleges, saying that segregation requirements violated the 14th Amendment, okay? Now, the 14th Amendment ensures all Americans equal protection under the law, all right? But under the Plessy v. Ferguson decision in 1896, the Supreme Court interpreted that to mean that, that you could have separate but equal, that as long as the accommodations were equal, they could have separate accommodations for black and white folks, okay? Now, the NAACP will start to get some, some victories here challenging this, though. For example, for the University of Texas Law School, uh, the NAACP sues uh, the, the law school saying that they uh, did not provide an equal environment for black and white students, law students. And some of their evidence for this was where the classes took place. The white students, they took classes in a large lecture hall that had nice windows, let in natural light, whereas the black students, their classroom was in the basement of the building with no windows, poor lighting, and so on. And these differences would be brought up and said, listen, you, you're not going to do as well in those two environments. The black folks have a, the black students have a disadvantage by being forced to take classes in this room that the white students don't have, okay? So they are separate, but they're not truly equal. And they win that case. And so we see that over time, these challenges to schools with this 14th Amendment argument begin to work. Now, we could also see when we start to zoom out, okay, that um, the numbers don't lie either. Uh, segregated school districts on average, it's been about 10 times more on their white students than black students, okay? And what this would translate into is like, well, at the white school, they'd have new desks, new furniture, the newest textbooks, newest editions of the textbooks. They have the best teachers. Where at the black schools, they might have broken furniture or hand-me-down furniture. They have the older editions of the textbook that have already been used and kind of ripped up and whatnot. Uh, the teachers might not get be as paid as well or be the higher level teachers. And all of this together meant that they were separate and not truly equal, okay? Now, what about this specific case here, Brown v. Board of Education in 1954, okay? Well, this specifically focuses on Topeka, Kansas, where in Topeka, Kansas, like in other parts of Kansas and other parts of the country, they had segregated schools, now, a young black girl named Linda Brown, uh, her parents wanted to enroll her in school. And there was a school four blocks from her house, okay? She could walk there every day and back to school. There was just one problem, that Linda Brown was African American, and this was a white school. And so instead, Linda Brown was enrolled at the uh, black school, the colored school, across town that she could in no way walk to. She'd have to get driven or picked up every day to go to school, okay? Now, the Brown family eventually would get uh, uh, connected to their local NAACP chapter, and then the NAACP sends a lawyer named Thurgood Marshall to lead the lawsuit against the uh, Topeka, Kansas school board to uh, make it where Linda Brown could attend the white school. And here, the uh, Thurgood Marshall uses that same argument that we just mentioned, that, that these schools, okay, they, even if they were truly equal, and there were a lot of pieces of evidence that said they were not truly equal, okay, by just their virtue of being separate, they imply that black children are inferior to whites, okay? 
Now, this is a psychological argument that is brought up here. Um, and this argument is, is very, very interesting. Uh, it has some basis to it. Um, there was, uh, and one of the persons uh, that was chosen as a witness in this case uh, was uh, the, uh, the Clark family. Um, Dr. Clark and his wife, Mammy, Kenneth and Mamie Clark, uh, they had conducted in the 1940s uh, the so-called doll test. And this doll test, what they did is they got white children and black children to act as participants in the study, their, or their parents, right, agreeing to it. And they would put the white kids and black kids by themselves in a room. And in this room, there was a table with a bunch of different dolls, okay? And the dolls, they ranged in color from white to black and with shades in between, okay? Now, when they did this experiment, Dr. Clark and his wife, they would see that um, when the white children went in there, unsurprisingly, the white children picked up the white doll to play with. That was not something that they thought, I mean, they kind of figured, they hypothesized that that would occur. But when they brought in the black uh, children to, uh, into the room with the dolls, they found that most of the black children also picked up the white doll. And when they would ask the black children, why did you choose the white doll over these other ones that looked more like them, black children would say things like, this doll looked prettier, or this doll looked nicer, right? And I mean, these are kids that are like five, six, seven years old. They're young children, right? They don't understand racism. They don't understand the legacy of all this and, you know, all, all of the legacy of slavery or any of that stuff. They're little kids. But they already are internalizing that people that look like them are not as good, okay? Now, this does end up, uh, these arguments do end up being successful. And they persuade uh, the Supreme Court. Of course, here's Thurgood Marshall with his legal team. This, right down there, that's Linda Brown. Linda Brown, uh, who just passed away uh, last year. Um, so she's, but she's a very young girl uh, when this case occurs in 1954. Now, Marshall himself, he, he becomes like a national, uh, gets national fame for leading this case. Uh, eventually, uh, this success would lead him to becoming the first black justice appointed to the Supreme Court in 1967 by President Lyndon Johnson. But in the short term, this case is a blockbuster. It's a unanimous decision, and the Supreme Court altogether, all nine justices, agree with Marshall's argument that separate facilities are inherently unequal. And in his decision, Chief Justice Earl Warren, he would state that segregation violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Uh, and so this overturns the Plessy v. Ferguson decision in 1896 and gets rid of separate but equal completely, okay? Now, at that point, most states in the country had some form of segregation. Now, down here in the South, we see areas where segregation was required by law, so there were only white and black schools. Uh, but you see elsewhere, some places it was permitted on a local level, okay? Uh, in some places, uh, it was not really talked about. It was like a local option. So places like California, they also had segregation, but their most notable segregation was segregation of, of, of Hispanic students, mostly Mexican-American students, from schools with white kids, but that would let local areas decide to have segregation. Although places in the north, segregation was prohibited. What we saw is due to that de facto segregation. In many places, schools were still mostly white schools or black schools based on where students lived. But this is a big change, right? Here's a little quote from the decision. Quote, today education is perhaps the most important function of state and local government compulsory or like required school attendance laws and the great expenditures for education both demonstrate our recognition of the importance of education to our democratic society. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Whoa. Now here is uh, Linda Brown and her mother on the steps of the courthouse at the Supreme Court with the headline, High Court Brand Segregation in Public Schools, okay? Now, simply put, 
this is a pretty uh, divisive decision, okay? Some areas in some big cities like uh, Baltimore, Maryland, St. Louis, Missouri, Washington, D.C. will very rapidly move to integrating their schools. But throughout the Deep South, we see state leaders heavily resisting integration, okay? And we also see, again, for the first time since the 20s, the Ku Klux Klan returning and kind of growing in power to try and block integration in southern states. Now, the president at the time was President Eisenhower, and he had a very hands-off thing on this. He said the states know what the law is, they'll follow the law, okay? And so he really left enforcement of this up to individual states, which sounds good in theory, but when you find out that basically all these southern state leaders were actually resistant to integration, meant that they get away with not doing it for a while. Here's an example of, uh, of our uh, governor here in the state of Georgia, uh, Herman Talmadge, and what he said about uh, the Brown decision. The people of Georgia will not comply with the decision of the court. We're going to do whatever is necessary in Georgia to keep white children in white schools and colored children in colored schools. Here's another quote from him. Non-segregation in our schools will never work as long as red blood runs in white men's veins. So he says it's never going to work. Okay, right? This is what you're up against. These guys are not going to just uh, integrate the schools just because the court told them to. Okay? Now, Eisenhower really tries to take this hands-off position, and he holds it until 1957. Okay? When his hand is forced by uh, an incident, not here in Georgia, but in Arkansas. Now, the governor of Arkansas at the time was a guy named Orville Faubus, and yes, that was his real name. Okay? Uh, and he took a pretty crazy action. Now, in Little Rock, Arkansas, the capital of Arkansas, uh, the biggest high school there at that time was Central High School. And in the 1957-58 school year, it was set to become integrated with nine black students joining the school, becoming the first nine students to black students to go to Little Rock Central High School. Okay? Now, to stop this, Orville Faubus will call up the Arkansas National Guard, okay, uh, which is technically part of the United States military, but he would call up the Arkansas National Guard to block the black students from entering the school, to stop them from enrolling. Now, Eisenhower, once he sees this, he realizes he must take action because he is a military man, okay? Now he's seeing the U.S. military being used to stop this legal order of, of, of the Supreme Court. And so Eisenhower flips it, and he will send in uh, the Army Airborne to go in, relieve the uh, National Guard, and then do the opposite and force the integration of the black students, force the allowing uh, the enrollment of, these, of the so-called Little Rock Nine into Central High School so they could go to school there that year, okay? Now, there's Orville Faubus, okay? Here are some of the, uh, the protests out front of the school. Look at some of these signs. I mean, crazy. And we mentioned this a little bit uh, in the last set of notes. Race mixing is communism. That was one of the things that was used a lot, kind of tying that Red Scare to civil rights, that civil rights protesters, they were secret communists, and they were being financed by the Soviet Union. That was an actual argument used by segregationists, that we would call them. Okay, now here are the Little Rock Nine. You see uh, uh, six uh, young women, uh, three young men who would be the first black students to integrate Central High School in Arkansas. It does not go great. They are yelled at, shouted at, called nasty words, called the N-word, called lots of different things, spit at, um, bullied. Okay, and in order to protect them, soldiers will follow them around all year long. Just imagine that. Like, a soldier is, is dedicated to protect you and walk you from class to class to class. That was the experience of the Little Rock Nine, okay? Now, long term, you know, this seems like success, all right? Eisenhower stepped in to enforce this, but it is going to have some problems in the short term, okay? Number one, uh, the segregationists do come up with a plan in Arkansas. So what they do is for the 1958-59 school year to prevent black students from enrolling at Central High School, 
They shut down all the public schools. There's actually a whole year in Little Rock where there is no public schooling. Now, Little Rock Central High School does open up as a private school for whites only, where only white students go to Central High School if they can pay for it. But most people in Little Rock don't, oh, kids in, they don't go to school because all the public schools are closed until they can figure out a better way to resist integration. And we will see that while, in theory, with the Supreme Court decision in 1954, all school systems in the South should be integrated, we would find in some cases it wouldn't be until the 1970s that school systems in the South are fully integrated uh, due to the Brown decision, okay? With that said, though, this is a start. This is the beginning and the first major step towards ending Jim Crow segregation in America, right? Now, it, it really only narrowly applies to public education. But we see that the NAACP is going to see, okay, we could use this 14th Amendment argument maybe to talk about other areas like segregation in uh, hotels and restaurants and other public accommodations, which is what they do. However, it also makes clear that the legal challenges should continue. Uh, cases like in the Supreme Court might turn out favorably, but you couldn't just uh, wait on the government to protect rights, okay? Because we're going to see that some leaders in the South, uh, segregations in the South, are going to actively uh, try to stop those changes, right? And folks in the government, they might be too scared to take drastic action on this stuff, right? And so new leaders are going to start to emerge in the late 50s and early 60s to take charge of the movement and to push it forward and to be activists to try and focus this and get the change, whether the government or the people, the white folks of the South, want it or not, okay? But that'll be a topic we'll get into much more in Unit 13 as we finish up the 50s and move into the 1960s. So we will stop it there, and we will see you next time. Bye!